Good morning. It's a very great pleasure to be here at this festive occasion, the new center, and I wish the center lots of success. But for me also, John Clark is extremely important. He's been such a good colleague and such a good friend over many years, and we are happy to pay attention to you these days. And we wish we can continue all that for a long time. So I will speak about superconducting circuits. And I'm a bit wedged in between Steve Gervin, who gave gen very general background, and Rob Shulkov, who will come after me and tell the real thing. So what, what, what I will do is maneuver in between. I will try to give you some background, how it all started and how it came about, and give some indications where it's going. Uh, but I'll just flash by uh, all kinds of circuits, and then you have to wait for Rob Shilkov to really explain that. But I also will try to, to argue that there is more than just building a quantum computer with superconducting quantum circuits, if I have some time left at the end. So where does it start? Superconductors are natural quantum systems in many ways. And as you all know, uh, the phase and the number are conjugate variables there. So all superconducting quantum circuits are based on, on this fact, if you want. I mean, you have to describe it. Um, so on the one hand, you have the density, the number. On the other hand, you have the phase. And the special thing is that the phase in a superconductor always meant something. Going back to Josephson, uh, this, the, the phase itself was already like a macroscopic variable, whereas usually in quantum systems, the phase was something that, was, that you averaged over or something you had to take it in the calculations. Here, it had a real physical meaning. And the gradient of the phase represents a current in a continuous superconductor. But the, the Josephson junction, really made the big difference. So we have Johnson junctions. Oh, I have to get used to. Uh, they have a, a Johnson coupling energy between two superconductors. And as you know, you have an energy that depends sinusoidal on the phase difference in this case. And also, if there is an external, if there is a, a current applied to the Johnson junction, there is a slope proportional to the current in the phase, in phase space. Uh, so this, this we call classical junctions. And, and, and this is nice to, to start with, because if you have that slope, you can see that the particle is fixed. I mean, if there's the minimum energy is for zero phase, or to pi or four pi. But if you tilt it, uh, it shifts a bit. And if you tilt it enough, there is no trap anymore. So it means that it escapes down. And that's the critical current. Now the question arose on the left here. If you ramp up the current, when does it switch? And then, of course, it switches certainly at the critical current, two-way voltage carrying state. Uh, these were experiments like in, what is it, beginning 80s, where the switching things were measured. And of course, it can switch just a bit before the critical current by thermal activation, crossing that barrier. So this is Kramer's escape theory, etc. Question was, can it also escape by quantum tunneling? And there were measurements where, uh, let's say, the temperature was decreased. And you could see that uh, the tunneling, the escape, didn't change anymore. So that could be quantum tunneling. But then if you have a lot of noise in your system and you come to a certain low temperature, it doesn't change either. So the question is, how do you prove that it's really a quantum effect? And this is where John Clark came in uh, with visitors and his group. Uh, and they did the escape problem 
But they realized that in such a potential well, if it's a real quantum system, you have discrete levels. So if you apply microwaves that are resonant with these energy differences, that should make a strong, should have a strong influence on this kind of escape. And that's what they showed very convincingly. So I remember that as a, personally also at that time, as a very strong indication, yeah. It behaves like a quantum particle. And this is a macroscopic object. It's a junction. It has a billion electrons involved and whatever. It's like a single quantum system. And that's where it started. And there were also other experiments after that strengthened the feeling, yes, that is possible. And this is, this is another one. Um, and that started with studying single electrons now, matter is, can you have single electrons in, in a metal where there are so many electrons around? And, uh, but it turned out that you can, you could show that. And in a Josephson system, in a superconducting system, if your voltage bias a junction, a junction naturally has a capacitance in the shunt, but if you make the area small, then uh, this charging energy can be significant. So in the end, in all these quantum circuits, it's a competition on the one end between EJ, the Josephson coupling, the phase coupling, and the charge energy. And they have to be of comparable magnitude. If one is much larger than the other, you're either in the charge regime and you talk about single charges, and, or you are in the Josephson classical Joseph regime. And so this is called the Cooper pair box. If there's no tunneling of Cooper pairs, single, single Cooper pairs, you would have two parabola crossing at half a Cooper pair charge. If you induce, I mean, the charge is the one you induce on the gate there. And then if there is Joseph coupling, there's an avoided crossing. And that avoided crossing can be made tunable by making this junction, a double junction, and that is the, the tunable Cooper pair box. And several groups, uh, particularly in Sakli, and also in Japan, and NEC, they showed that this could be controlled. Now, at that stage, I distinctly remember, and I think we all who were in the field at that time, there were many excellent theorists that told us, oh, come on, this is never going to work. You think, so this, yes, maybe you see some effects. But if you think about doing coherent quantum operations with these systems, forget it. And, 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 and if you think about it, that makes sense to say that. I mean, what is a superconductor? Think about BCS theory. How many Cooper pairs do you have? You take arbitrary cutoff of the energy around the Fermi level and then say, okay, these are the ones that participate. And that gives you the Cooper pair. So how in the world could that be a, a fi fixed discrete number? But there were so many experiments that kept indicating that you could do it, starting with the, the Berkeley experiment, um, that we all felt, no, there is it, so we kept going. But there were very good arguments not to do it. And I personally remember I was at a meeting, a very exciting meeting at the ITP. I think I was the only condensed matter person there. And there were lots of theorists and quantum optics people and trapped ions. Uh, and, and they all had nice operations going. And I asked Chang and said, Lloyd, help me understand what they were doing. And I tried to understand what we could do. And we came up with a crude scheme. And I gave a talk there. And, and for me, it started there and, and, and for others uh, in the same time. But I remember Murray Gell-Mann, who is, I mean, if you talk about a quantum physicist, he really counts, that's for sure. And he was there and he listened and he didn't say it's impossible. He just said, why would you want to do that? <laughs> if you have all these nice ions and photons and everything, I mean, who cares? 
and that is only 20 years ago. And now I think we can say that superconducting circuits do count on a comparable level. There are advantages, disadvantages. But if people give an indication who is going to do the quantum computer, certainly superconductor systems are a serious contender. We have to see. Anyway, let me continue. So when did, we have, when did the first coherent quantum operation with superconducting systems occur? That was in 1990. Uh, and, and, and surprised us all. That was uh, by Nakamura NEC group, Nakamura Chai, uh, what they did. And they used a arbitrary wave generator, which was amazing. It was on, actually on the picosecond level. It was a very expensive thing, but NEC was a computer company and they had it. And they used it very smartly. What they did is start, this is the Cooper pair box. So you have states here. Uh, with the avoided crossing. And what they did is start here in state what they call zero, zero Cooper pairs. It says two here, but that's two electrons. It's a single Cooper pair. And then they very fast, you see the pulse shape here, switch it to this point and then let it sit there. And if there is a real quantum superposition, it will start oscillating at the rate of the energy difference. And then they switch back here. Now, if, if, you, if this oscillation occur, it may work in a way, if you change the, the gate voltage, that it moves up there. And then there will be a quasi, -par I mean, you, you end up in a, with a quasi part that will relax later. And they repeated it so fast that they could measure a current of relaxing quasi particles. It was a, a brute force approach, but it worked quite well. And this is the picture. And they showed what the theory would predict, and it fitted exactly. So this was, but um, it happened. It was not really a qubit, but it was clear that you could, that this was just a matter of adapting a bit, and that is what they did. So yeah, you can do coherent dynamics with superconducting systems, as from 99. This is in the Cooper Bear box. Cooper pair box uses charges. Now, nature is very asymmetric in one particular way. I mean, you have electric fields and magnetic fields, you have electric charge, but you don't have magnetic monopoles around in our part of the universe, at least. So it happens, it's clear that there's much more chance that you have a strong, that you have a single charge buzzing around in your system, then you have magnetic things going on. So it turns out that naturally decoherence in a purely charge-dominated system is very light. Charge noise is difficult to get rid of. In the end, you have to get rid of charge noise and flux noise to get everything right, because you can never completely disconnect them. But it was difficult. Uh, so. Uh, it made sense to try other systems. This was a version of the Berkeley experiment that could also, that was the phase qubit Martinez did that. You could use two levels here. It had certain disadvantages and was abandoned. What we, together with MIT, the M and Terry Orlando and his group, and, and we developed the flux quantum which is the dual, in many ways, to the Cooper pair box, where you have a loop with junction in it, and you make a superposition of flux states, if you want. Let's say you let a 2 pi phase difference jump in and out of that loop, and the outer thing is measuring that. So this uh, is even more macroscopic than a Cooper pair box, because this is a loop which has a, a current of half a microam or something that is either going this way or that way. And, and the idea is this can be a superposition of those two things. And people told me, no, that this is nonsense. I remember, I won't mention names, but people explaining, oh, forget it. But it worked, and we saw the superposition. And then, and then it took us 
three years to go from seeing the superposition in spectroscopy to going to really coherent Rabi oscillations. And why is that? You have to improve everything a lot. And since then, both in Delft, we, we improved it even more. So we went from, let's say, this, in this experiment, we may have had a coherence time of 10 or 20 nanoseconds. Here it was 150. But here it was already one and a half microsecond. And now there's a recent paper by MIT group, fantastic Oliver, uh, Oliver group in MIT, and they improved the flux cube with much more. And nowadays it has also coherence of order 80, let's say, this is T2, 85 microseconds. And it can be improved still. It can be improved. And, and it has certain advantages. For instance, it can be coupled extremely strong, strongly to a resonator. So you can not have just strong coupling, you can have super strong or ultra strong uh, coupling. The coupling can be stronger than the level splitting, if you want. Okay. So why did everything improve, improve not only in the flux qubit, but in all these qubits? That is because control was cranked up. And I won't go in all the details. But on all these fields, we had to improve our techniques. And that took years to do, but it worked. I just, I won't read the list, but I could have added other things too. So that, that is the work you do, or what the students do. So I sit there and tell them, do it again. It's not good enough, but anyway. But then the, the big step, the big further step, came uh, with two, for me, couples uh, uh, things happened. One is the transmond, the other is the next slide, is the quantum, the, uh, the QED, the, the high quality resonators, because they are Together, it's such a strong effect. What is this? This is a Cooper box, which is degenerate. Uh, EJ has been made, EC, the charging energy has been decreased. EJ has been increased, if you want, the ratio energy anyway increased. And so this is no longer a real Cooper box. And for that reason, it's not as sensitive to charge noise as it used to be. And that is the main goal. But you can still, so, I mean, you would think there is almost nothing left, but you can now use this because you couple it to a, uh, a high Q oscillator. So you could not have the transform without the oscillator. You could, but it would be useless, I think. Um, and this is the other sh slide where uh, the Yale groups, I think, together showed that you can make solid state superconducting strip lines and make extremely high uh, quality strip lines and make high quality resonators. And here you see that they could tune, tune the gap. Uh, between the two states and tune them, for instance, this the oscillator state and then tune it through the gap and, and see this, this kind of transitions. So the coupling is needed. And so this is, this is the basis for all the extremely uh, powerful developments of following years. And this was, the, should be there, 2004. And now, Uh, yeah. From there, you, once you have one going, you can get two. And the coupling now is always, the, the oscillator is used to, to do all the interactions. There's, with a few exceptions, no direct interactions. So it's always the, the oscillator. So this is two. This is one I remember that I liked it very much. Martinez group, where they uh, showed that by taking these objects and the high Q oscillator, they could generate photon states, Fox states with a very well-defined number of photons. And they could actually make 
uh, uh, superpositions of Fox states. And it, this is uh, a set you can perhaps see. So this is, for instance, a superposition of zero and three and six uh, photons in one cavity. And then if they did the calculation of what it should be, that's the bottom, and this is the experiment, uh, and, and it fitted. And so I had the feeling, okay, now we can play, we assuming that as a superconducting community, we can talk on the same level as quantum optics people in some sense. So we can do things that they couldn't easily do and haven't certainly not done for five years before us, as was usually the case. Okay. And one could do two qubit op operations. So I'll not go into the details here. This is three qubits. Now, that kept growing. And Steve Gervin already talked about error correction. And uh, we, it was, of course, realized that even if you improve the coherence times many orders of magnitude, it's never good enough. You always want more. So it's extremely important that there are tricks and techniques to improve this. And Rob will talk about a special technique. This is another one. This is uh, the so-called surface states, where you make a 2D array of qubits. And uh, you have one kind that are really the, the, the physical qubits, the other are also qubits, but you use them to sense errors and correct them. And so you build up the system in that way. And uh, so this is called the surface code based on Kitayev ideas. This is the other. This is uh, the, the, one of the most recent papers I could find where you have nine qubits and, and start playing these, these games. So what you see here is uh, you spread the information of one qubit over many qubits in time and then later take it out. This is the, the Yale approach, and I'll leave it to Rob to explain that. And I'm coming from Delft, so I can't help talking about, I mean, showing at least a few pictures from Delft. Also there you build up multiple qubits and aim for the sur to realize the surface code. And what you're supposed to notice that coming from these old experiments to control the whole fabrication, everything looks much better and is much better. And this is, I mean, you have things like crossovers, Etc. that are well controlled. And this is uh, also from Delft. Now, what is extremely important is also that in some way, when the quantum systems get larger and more complicated, you have to drive them and you have to couple them to classical uh, uh, driving signals, and also when you read out, you have to collect that information. And that is, if you think about a large 2D system, is not an easy task. And that is why I am extremely happy that a company like Intel, who happens to have a person here, but that is, uh, uh, is, is, is getting involved in these, playing these games. And it really works, and I, that's why I like that collaboration very much. It works because Intel people come to Delft, I see them, they talk with the people. They don't only work on superconducting systems, but also on silicon, quantum dots, etc. And, and this is going to take the field many steps further, I think, if we have that kind of collaboration. Now, collaboration with industry is, has been changing very fast in the last years. So there are, there are more examples. But if it comes to building quantum computers, these are industries that are now involved. IBM has its own research group, but it is an industry. So that is, of course, industry connection. But recently, we have seen that 
Google took over the Santa Barbara group and hired John Martinez and hired other people and suddenly that group, it may still be in Santa Barbara, but it's now labeled Microsoft. And we have seen something similar in Delft where part of our effort is, um, yeah, it's been, uh, let's say, the, the, the topological computing, uh, which is partly superconducting, not, not really, but superconductors are involved there, uh, is now called Microsoft. Um, I must confess, I have, I, I may be an old person, getting an old person, but uh, it's um, already, no. <laughs> anyway. Uh, it's dangerous, I think. I like industry being involved. It's needed. There's no way that universities can build quantum computers. But yeah, question is, if university people step over to industry in, in, in a way that they could any moment move to a different building outside the campus, that's a weak uh, uh, binding. And I. I like centers like the one that has been inaugurated today uh, very much, where you have people with different disciplines working together, teaming up, helping each other, learning from each other, and also being able to apply for large grants. That's also part of having large centers, I think. I mean, in Delft, we, we have that also, different disciplines. But if, I mean, that kind of strong binding is dangerous. I don't have that feeling with Intel. Begit as getting up. The, the one thing, if I had a chance that I would like to have continued, but it fits, if I may have half a minute, is let's all not forget when all this, this quantum computing and building large computers is going on, that there is a lot of physics still to be done. And there's very nice physics outside building a quantum computer. And you, you do need more physics to get the quantum computer right. But also by itself, there's so, I had several examples, but I don't have time. And people should continue to study those and, 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 and have new things come up that are not just in the line of, let's say, transmon based QED uh, quantum computing, etc. Let's, let's have a broad basis of small projects as well. And I, I'll stop, because otherwise... Uh, yeah. So we have some questions. So, so let me ask you something about the quantum classical interface. So a number of years ago, when people, long before people were actually thinking of or doing things at this level, there was sort of discussion among theorists about the interface issue. And there were sort of horror stories about the classical in quantum interface requiring huge overhead in resources and space and operations. Is that, from your perspective, has there, has there been significant progress in this? To be honest, I, I, don't, I don't see direct progress yet. Yeah. Uh, but I see a lot of progress. Now people start building systems mm -hmm. and, I mean, have to Just face that. Yeah. But I, no, I couldn't say that, that, let's say, on the theoretical part, there has been, I don't know. Okay. I am more interested in doing it and see whether yeah. it works. Yeah. yeah. But with the architectures like the surface code and so on, yeah. there has been a significant step forward, I think, on, yes, the, on the theoretical side. Yes, that will be side. an issue, for sure, yeah. 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 Okay. I'm somewhat blinded by the light here, so I can't see if there's anyone. Got a question over there. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, just curious as to what, maybe one or two things on your next slides. <laughs> no, that's not the way. <laughs> no. Okay. So do, are, you, are you holding your pen sort of up? 
<laughs> it's not it. <laughs> like at an auction, if you move something, you, you have okay. votes. Okay, well, let's, let's yeah. thank Hans again yeah. for a very provocative talk. Yeah.